Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life changed through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening. Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you here. If we haven't met before, my name is Brett, and we have the honor of jumping into an amazing passage today. We're in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31, and it is, it is a life-changing passage that I think that has touched countless, countless people, Christ followers, through the years. And as I was prepping for uh, our time together today, <clears throat> I went back to a memory. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of things in life that happen that you forget about, thankfully, right? Thankfully. <clears throat> then you have sometimes some moments where God just does something so uniquely that it leaves like an image in your brain. You know, it just leaves. And, and I had one of those moments. Um, one of the cool things that our church does is, and we've been doing this for years, is taking a lot of 18 to 25-year-olds to a conference every year called Passion. And the Passion Conference has been in D.C., but it's mostly in Atlanta. And one year... Uh, we were at Passion, and, uh, you know, they let me tag along um, probably to buy people dinner and lunch and whatever else. But um, so I was in this moment here, and we were, I don't know, thousands of us uh, in one of the major stadiums down in Atlanta. And <clears throat> I had a moment where I kind of got lost in the moment. Uh, the worship set was happening. Um, there was an artist named David Crowder. Maybe you've heard of Crowder. Crowder was leading this song. And as, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you're listening to a, a piece of music and you just kind of like forget where you are, you're not thinking about time, you're not thinking about where you are, like what's happening, you're not thinking about the next thing you have to do, you're just totally lost in a moment. Who's been lost in a moment like that with music? Yeah, music has the power to do that. And I had one of those moments where I was listening to thousands and thousands of young people sing this song, and I was just totally engulfed in it. And then I was getting goosebumps. Not only because as a leader, one of your dreams is when you take a bunch of young people, one of my dreams is to have the, the, people, the young people jump in and get it and be encouraged by God's word. Like as a pastor, that's just a dream come true, and that was happening but I had one of these moments where it wasn't just about me ministering to these young people and uh, serving them. It was a moment where God was really serving me. You had that happen before? Where you're thinking I'm serving somebody else and suddenly God's like, oh no, I'm, I'm ministering to you while you're ministering to them. And that's what was happening. I was lost in this song. And the song is called How He Loves Us. And I'm not going to sing it to you this morning. And you're welcome. And I also want to thank you for not saying amen to that. You can say amen later, but not to me not singing to you. But I want to read some of the, the lyrics to you. And the song goes, uh, begins, uh, He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And then I realize how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. So we are his portion and he is our prize. Isn't that great? Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean... We're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. So all these young people are singing this song, and I'm lost in this moment, and I, I think to myself, like, I, I actually believe this. 
I actually believe that he loves me. And that line, if, if grace was an ocean, we're all sinking. I'm like, oh my goodness, God's grace is all around me and provides for me. Like, what a great God. See, for a long time, I, I honestly believe, sometimes this is reversed for us. For me, I, I knew that God liked me because I saw his favor in my life. <clears throat> sometimes it's reverse. Some people know that God loves them, but they're not sure if he likes them. Well, for me, it was, it was I knew God liked me. But having this deep understanding of his love for me was something that I had to like, be really reminded of and have an encounter with Jesus that he provided just to reinforce the fact, oh, no, I love you. And he used music to do that, and he used 20,000 young people to affirm that in my life. Do you know how much God loves you? Like, Do you know how crazy God is for you? The proof is the cross. And the Apostle Paul is, has a, a, an audience to the church in Rome. And then everybody else, thanks to the fact that it's in Scripture, <clears throat> to remind all of us that God is, God is just in love with you. He just loves you. And we can't even quite comprehend, co- comprehend it. So as we jump in today, we're in Romans, as I said, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And it starts off with this great passage here, or this great thought, that God is for you. So let's jump in here. So what then shall we say, what then shall I say, or we say in response to these things? So basically what Paul's doing is he's going back to the last thought he had, about how as Christ's followers, we're justified, we're redeemed, we're sanctified, we're set apart, we're glorified. There's a future reserved for us in heaven. All that, what should I say in response to like this awesome truth that God loves us and he's got us? What do I say in response to that? And then he goes on to say, well, if God is for us, who can be against us? Turn to your neighbor and say it. If God is for you, who can be against you? Go ahead. It's okay. If God is for you, who can be against you? He goes on to say, verse 32, and think about this. Here's his argument. If God is for you, who can be against you? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Think about it like this. If God is willing to sacrifice his only begotten son for you, if he's willing to give the biggest thing, why won't he take care of all the smaller things? If he's willing to take care of the biggest thing ever, which is your sin debt, like, You and I were never, we couldn't live a thousand lives and be able to pay or earn our salvation. We couldn't do it because you're going to be imperfect a thousand times. And so we needed somebody, his name is Jesus, to be perfect for us and to pay a price for us that I couldn't pay and that you can't pay. And Jesus in his one life paid the price for your sin debt. So sin is anything you do, say, or think that displeases God. God is holy. He's righteous. And so because we do things that displease him, we're set, up, we're set apart from him. There's a gulf. There's a great divide. And so we needed a sacrifice to bridge the great divide. And his name is Jesus. And God says, well, if I'm willing, if I'm willing to give you Jesus to take care of your greatest need ever, don't you think I'll take care of everything else? I remember um, these moments and glimpses where I come close to understanding God's love, like close. And one of those moments, and and maybe many of us in this room can identify with this, was um, after eight and a half years of infertility, uh, my wife gets pregnant. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Like, how'd that happen? And I knew how it happened. So... (laughs) 
But, like, we didn't think we could have a kid on our own. Like, and God took care of it for us. He's good. And so this, after, like, you know, imagine all those years of wanting to have a kid, and then finally God provides. And I, and I remember the whole time while Jenny was pregnant, I, like, wanted to wrap her in bubble wrap. You know, like, don't leave the home. Like, we got this, right? Because I just want it. And, and one time she was actually in a car accident while this happened, totaled the car, but the baby was okay, spent the night in the hospital. Like, that's nerve-wracking. Who's been there before? That is nerve-wracking. And I remember finally, after all these years and all this prayer, and I can't tell you how many people that love Jenny and love me prayed for this, whatever it looked like. Like, it could have been adoption, and that would have been awesome too. But for us to be able to be parents and to care for and nurture and raise up uh, young people to love Jesus and pass on the faith from one generation to the next. That was just our prayer. And so I got a glimpse of God's love as I was holding baby Matthew, which means gift of God, in my hands. And I remember thinking, how can I love more than this? Like, I, I cannot, um, this, I love this little being. And I remember, like, you know, he didn't understand me, but I told this dude, I was like, dude, I got you. Like, buddy, I got you. It's, it's, me, or, it's me and you. <clears throat> and I felt this depth of love. And I remember thinking, well, if God gives us another kid, how can I love the other kid as much as I love the first one? And we don't. <laughs> I'm not saying that at, like, the next service. But, no, we do. And what happens is, and what happens is, God actually, and you've seen this with your second kid, if you've had more than one, you have the second kid, and suddenly you're like, oh my goodness, God made my heart bigger. He expanded my heart to help me love another little sinner <laughs> who will eventually break my heart over and over again. No. And so that gave me a glimpse. Parents, grandparents, you with me here, aren't you? It gave me a glimpse of the Father's love for me. And Jesus said, like, if, if your earthly father, who's not perfect, provides for you, how much more will your heavenly father take care of you? And I think I'd do anything for my kids. Anybody else here? you do anything. You are. I'd do anything. And so think about how much God loves you. And if you have the ability, though imperfect and a sinner, to love other people, in such a fierce way, how much more does a perfect God fiercely love you? If God is for you, no one can stand against you. Number two, God silences all our accusers so you can live in freedom. So if God's for you, no one can stand against you. It doesn't matter if it's a hardship or a tragedy the question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? The idea of, of this is, listen, if, if there's a hardship in your life, the only way that this hardship is going to take you away from God himself in a relationship with him is if your hardship is bigger than God. If there's a difficulty in your life, the only way that you're going to be separated from the love of God as if the difficulty was bigger than God himself. So we're starting up a ministry at East York, part of our church, for addiction to help people and encourage people that are going through and wrestling in addiction. And uh, Pastor Don assembled a team for this, and they were coming up with names. And we actually have had uh, groups that have met called uh, Big God, Little Addiction. And so everybody involved on this team was like, no, we actually like that name. We like that name. And these are all people in recovery. And they're helping other people in recovery by the grace of God that, you know, that they have in their lives. And so they actually said, oh, no, 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 we like that name. Some of us hear Big God, a little addiction, and we think, oh, well, are you trying to say that my addiction is is little. Like, it's kind of a big deal for me. It's kind of messing up my life. It's messed up my friends' lives, funerals I've been to, all this stuff. And what the group was saying, oh, no. No, no, it might be big to us, but it's small to God. 
It might be big to us and consuming and all this, but it's nothing compared to the vastness and power of God. In fact, we actually have freedom and recovery from our addiction because of how big our God is. Right? Because in order for us to be separated from the love of God, the addiction has to be bigger than God, and there's no addiction that's bigger than God. Amen? Like, what, what could go against him? Like nothing. No one. God silences our accusers so we can live in freedom. Look at this in verse 33 here. So who will bring a charge, any charge, against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Then, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. God silences our accusers. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. If you are a Christ follower, saved by God's amazing grace, and you believe in him and trust him through faith, no one's got anything on you. Not even, not even your greatest enemy. Not even Satan himself. So scholars actually believe that when Paul's talking to us about um, bringing a charge or one who condemns, he's actually talking about Satan. We know in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, that's one of Satan's names. In fact, the one he's probably most proud of, which is sick, right? That's just him, is the accuser of the brethren. Which means a lot of times we think that Satan's job is just to tempt us, and there is temptation. But I believe, and maybe you've seen this too, and you can see it right there in Scripture, that probably his biggest job is to accuse us, to condemn us, to steal our joy. He can't take your soul, so what does he want to take? He wants to take your joy, your uh, ability to be effective, loving and serving Jesus and serving the people that God's placed in your life. He wants to stop you from sharing your faith because if he's got you thinking all about how messed up you are, well, you're not going to pass that on other people. And so he is the, the accuser of the brethren. And he wants to accuse, and he's always accusing us. His greatest weapon is accusation, especially at 2.30 in the morning. And so what are some of the things that the evil one tries to whisper into our ear? Well, maybe he tells us that we're worthless. Maybe he tries to tell us that we're not a good parent, not a good dad, not a good mom, Maybe he tells us, well, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have said that or done that. Who do you think you are sharing your faith? Has it made a difference in your life? And what we find, not only in this passage, but throughout all of Scripture, especially at the end, right, where Jesus wins, well, we know he wins, right, is that you can have victory over the accuser, but it's not going to be in your own strength. And not even if 10 of you get together. Not even if all of us got together in our own strength, try to do it. But we do have victory because of Jesus' strength. And so if Satan tells you you're weak, you say, yeah, you're right. But what's your response? But he's strong. Right? And when Satan says, well, yeah, you lied about that. You must not believe the word of God. Oh, no, I believe the word of God, and I'm going to repent of that lie. And you can't hold that against me now because I've been forgiven and covered by the blood of Jesus. See, there's a difference here between what the Holy Spirit does in our life and what Satan does. And you can test the spirits based on asking, like, what's it pointing to? So if it's the evil one, it's always moving towards shame. If it's the Holy Spirit, it's always moving towards peace. Shalom. So it's either shame or shalom. Either one's moving you towards Jesus and being sanctified and identifying with Christ and who he is and his finished work on the cross and what the power you have as a believer in Christ because of all those things that have been, you've inherited. Or it's you're worthless, you're no good, you better just shut up, keep it all to yourself, no one likes you. What, what are you even thinking doing this and that? Don't go to church. 
Don't go to church. They're all hypocrites. Yeah, don't do that. No, it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you need to get up, go to church, love on people, let them love you, read the word together, celebrate. It's either peace moving you towards Jesus or it's moving you away and it's shame. And so as we discern the spirit, we, we ask God, is this of you? So if you get up at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning and you're woken by, you say, God, is this of you? And you pray about that. God, give me wisdom to discern. And if it's your, you wake up at 2.30 in the morning because you're like, oh, yeah, I lied to that person, then what should you do at 2.30 in the morning? You repent. Say, Jesus, I am so sorry. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And I was not telling the truth today, so I wasn't honoring you. Will you forgive me and help me just to go make right tomorrow? And then what do you do? You make right when? Right away. The best time to make right is when? Right away. And if it's 2.30 in the morning, you need to send a text saying, hey, I'm going to give you a call or can we meet for lunch? Will you send that? They'll get in the morning. Unless they are also were woke, woken up at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> right? God silences our accusers so we can live in freedom. The Holy Spirit wants you to depend on God the Father, and he will prompt you and move you towards him. And you and I need to yield to the Spirit. Basically, the yield to the Spirit means have your way. You go first, I follow. Take me where you want me to go. And as we seek to follow Jesus and we yield to the Spirit, the Holy Holy Spirit moves us, and he convicts us of our sin, and he draws us back to fellowship. Think about it this way. The Holy Spirit convicts. Satan condemns. Conviction, condemnation. And we know in verse 1 of this amazing chapter that if you're a Christ follower, there's now what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we let the Holy Spirit convict And as we follow his prompting in our life, we become more like Jesus. Feels like you're winning when you're listening to the Holy Spirit, right? Doesn't it feel like that? Feels like you're winning. So there's four four things, four realities we get in this, this like two verses here that protect our relationship. Number one, we it says here that Christ died for us and he paid the penalty. His death paid the penalty for our sins. That Christ was raised from the dead. Proving his victory over sin and death. Amen? Who's thankful for that? Right? Proving his victory over sin and death. And he's at the right hand of God. And what is he doing there? He's interceding for us until every soul is safe with him in heaven. That's what he does. And so here is, here is Jesus the Lamb of God, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and he, accuse, he silences our accusers. And so next time you feel like this negative talk happening in your head, and you're not sure where it is, you can just tell Satan, not today. Right? Not today, Satan. Right? You've heard that line? You can say it. And if you need to speak Jesus over it, you speak Jesus over it. If you need to read Scripture, read Scripture to encourage your soul. He's not going to win. He's not winning the war. Amen? Amen. Right? So we fight the battles. And we fight the good fight. And part of the fight is like this is a real cosmic battle happening. It's actually happening in this room right now. And and there's a lot of things in life where we, in our Western world especially, where we just, just dismiss. And we don't even know until eternity what was really spiritual warfare. But we do know we need to fight the fight and put on the armor of God, Ephesians tells us, right? And so you're at war. And the good news is you're on the winning side. Love conquers all. And so now we need to take that seriously and live in victory. Let's look at this. It's in uh, verse 35 here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness? What about danger? What about the sword? So here's Paul pulling out all the stops, gives us these, what, what, seven different hardships or types of hardships. And it doesn't matter what the hardship is. is it, can be, it can be trouble. Well, that's not separating you from the love of God. It can be difficulties and hardships. Is that going to separate you from the love of God? No. 
What about if you don't have enough clothes? Oh no, God still loves you and he provides. If he takes care of the lilies, right, and the birds, surely he'll take care of me, right? And he provides help, people to come alongside, right? What about danger from sword? Someone's gonna, well, God's got me. And even if I do end up dying from this, I get to spend eternity with heaven. Guess who wins? I'm still winning. And so even if it's difficult, even if it's not easy, well, it was never promised it was going to be easy in the first place, was it? What did Jesus tell his disciples? He made a guarantee. He said this, in this life you will have what? Troubles, tribulation. And man, if he ended right there, it would have been really depressing. Right? Aren't you glad he didn't? He didn't stop right there? The rest of the thought says what? But take heart. I've overcome the world. Christ follower, what would it live? What would it look like if you lived as if you were on the winning side? What would it look like in your relationships if you live like you were a follower of Jesus and his word is truth? And so you're like, you know what? I'm building my life on Jesus. That's the rock by which I stand. Right? What would it look like if we actually, instead of just saying, yeah, I believe it, where we actually like tested our thoughts to say, do I really believe this? Jesus, help me to live this out. Because I believe it in theory, but do I believe it in action? Like, I want to believe it. And then you need to give yourself permission, like, to mess up as you're trying and cling to God's grace. Like, give you, like you're going to mess up. You're not going to do it perfectly. But that's why, like, you, we can never do it perfectly anyway. That's why we need, need God's help for Everything. Everything. So what's going to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. And then he assures us that, that followers of God, have had, they, they've had hardship and troubles forever. Right? Since when sin entered into the world, that was the beginning of difficult times. It's just part of this deal here, right? And boy, it gets a lot better, doesn't it? Who can testify that life can be really good? It can be really good. But you have perspective because you've also seen how life can be bad. And God uses the difficulties to give us perspective about the good things. If you want to have the good things, guess what, friend? God uses those difficult things to not only build your appreciation for the good things, but also to help you be more like Jesus. Because when you're going through a tough time, who do you need to cling to? You cling to Christ. So he quotes uh, David in Psalm 44, who was having a difficult time as he was running from Absalom. And in 36, he says, As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. God's people have always had hardship. Why do you feel like you're exempt from it? And why do you get mad when it happens? Obviously, you've got to work through those emotions when you hear bad news. God doesn't expect you to be like, you know, not real, with real life and real emotions. Why he gave you all those things. But there needs to be a place where we invite the perspective of God into the situation. And then we need to tell that big problem that, that you know what, we have a bigger God. He goes on to say in verse 37, No, and all these things, doesn't matter what it is, the danger, the persecution, whatever it is, people hating, whatever it is, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, it's not just more than conquerors because of how awesome I am. Because we're not. We know that. We've talked about that. We need Jesus for everything. If there is any awesomeness or anything good, it's all of him. Right? It's all of him. No, we're more than conquerors because we're identifying with Jesus Christ, who is the conqueror. Amen? He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So he's conquered sin and death. We identify with Jesus Christ, so we get to inherit all those blessings. And so the idea of more than conquerors means not only do we win, we keep on winning. We keep on winning. Even the difficulty, when I cling to God, he's going to use this to help me win for him. And ultimately, whether, whether whatever I'm feeling like in life is I trust Jesus, I look at the scoreboard, I'm like, yeah, it doesn't even have my name there. It just says God's chosen. Right, I look at the scoreboard, it's like, yeah, I'm winning every time. Like, I'm winning every time. 
And it doesn't matter if I'm going through these difficult things. I need God to help me through it. But the idea of more than a conqueror means that we overwhelmingly conquer. Verse 38, for I'm convinced That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things in the future, nor any powers, nor hype, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't love Jesus, if you haven't asked Christ to come into your life to forgive you of your sin debt, he loves you so much and he's calling you today. He's calling you today to trust in him. He's calling you and saying, child, I love you. You've never been alone. I've always taken care of you. And I've used all those things to bring you to this moment where you have to cling to me for everything. So I would invite you today, if you haven't trusted Christ Jesus, go to Next Steps afterwards. Come up and talk with some of us. We would love to talk to you about who Jesus is and how much he loves you and how you don't have to be alone You don't have to be alone. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Who's found that to be true, Christ follower? Raise your hand. Right? You're not alone. You're more than a conqueror. And the idea here is Christ followers, we need to kind of go along with what what Paul's saying here. We need to actually believe that we actually need to be convinced. Need to be convinced that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That's what happened when I was listening to that song I was convinced, oh my goodness, God, you are so good. And we need to remind ourselves, there's nothing in all of creation that will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. So you can't read a passage like this and just think, oh yeah, that's well and good. There has to be application. Like, you can't, can't be confronted with such an amazing truth and not be changed by it. And so, a few thoughts here. Number one, do you have this kind of confidence? Or do you want to have this kind of confidence? Do you want to walk securely into the future knowing that God's, God will provide for you regardless? Do you want to be in a spot where you're not fearing anything that Satan might whisper into your ear? Because you're actually listening to God and his Holy Spirit. And you're testing the spirits there and, and putting what you're hearing from the evil one compared to the truth of God. Do you have the confidence to be able to stand against anything or anyone with a God type of confidence? That no matter what life throws at you, you know that you have a God that's bigger and he's better and he's got you. He's got you. He's got this. So one of the things that I've found in my life, and I have, and I, I think all of us maybe if you go through, like all these things in this little this checklist that he gives us, you've probably faced most of those things. And some of those things you knew exactly what they were, so you call them out. That is what it is. Um, I, I, get, I get life or death. I get that. I get the present. Uh, I understand the future. I think I might understand the powers, whatever. <clears throat> but you've also, whether you know it or not, you've also have fought a battle that's unseen. He mentions angels or demons. There is a spiritual war raging. And Ephesians tells us to do what? To put on the full armor of God. I have seen firsthand the power of God over, over Satan. and I've seen it. Like every time someone confesses Christ, we see it and we celebrate it. Every time we baptize somebody, we celebrate. That's why we get loud. We don't give golf claps when someone gets baptized. Do you understand what just happened, what they did there? They're proclaiming their love for Jesus forever. Like why are we all like, yay, are you kidding me? If the angels are having a party... And Jesus said it needs to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, you better believe. You better start dancing. Right? I mean, come on, people. We're so stoic. Yay. Are you kidding? Man. So I saw this demon uh, spiritual warfare thing firsthand, and I don't have a lot of time to tell it. But I want to give glory to God that he has power over it. And there was one time actually... um, 
where I actually was with. I had a pastor that, that I used to work with actually at my first church I was at. We were down in Maryland for 11 years, and his name was Conrad. And Conrad actually had this unique giftedness to help people that were going through uh, spiritual warfare and difficulties. So much so that other pastors in the area would say, hey, Conrad, I got someone. Will you help? And so he would get calls with people that might be demon-possessed. And he would take the 23-year-old me with him to help him in these moments. In one case, uh, we went to someone's house and said, Pastor Conrad, I need you to come to my house. And I have all these things from the occult and new age and mysticism. And I want you to throw it all away. I don't want it in my house anymore. And I need you to do it. And I'm giving you permission to do it. And then there's also a bunch of other things that I've invited into my life. And I need you to pray over every room in our house. I need you to pray over me. And Conrad's like, yeah, I'll take Brett along. And I was like, uh, what? We get to, uh, we're in his minivan, and we're in the parking lot of this apartment where we're getting ready to go help this lady with all this stuff. And he turns to me, and Conrad's like 10 years older than me, so he's like 33, 34, and I was like 23, and my voice was still cracking. And, and <clears throat> he says to me, he turns and says, so Brett, here, just real quick, we're going to take a moment before we get it on the elevator to go up to her apartment. Um, just pray. We're both going to pray. And if there's anything you just need to confess and give to God right now, just give it to him. Well, you better believe I was praying for everything. Jesus, forgive me when I stole that bubble gum when I was five. And, and forgive me for the argument I had with my wife last night and how I was a jerk. And some of you are hearing that, well, yeah, Brett, you probably are always the jerk. And when it comes to, if you know my wife, she's awesome. And so I typically, I typically am re- praying that prayer. And so we're praying out all these things and we're like, ready. He's like, all right, are you ready? I was like, no, (laughs) but I will be, right? You ever been there before? Like, God help me. So we go up there and we start helping her throw stuff away and she started getting very aggravated and there was something else going on. So Conrad in his wisdom was prompted to say, hey, let's sit down. He starts talking to this woman and different voices started coming out of her. And he knew what was going on here. He wasn't scared. I borrowed his confidence, right? You heard of the word encouragement, right? I, he was encouraging me. I was borrowing his courage in that moment, right? Which is what we do for each other, right, church? And she looks at me and says, what are you doing here trying to help me? You... You don't know what's going on. I know everything going on with you. Hey, that fight you had with your wife last night? And Conrad right away stopped. Any other accusation said, you need to stop right there because you know what? He's a child of God forgiven. Cleansed by the blood of the lamb. You have no power or authority over him. He is God's. He belongs to Jesus Christ and he's sealed with the Holy Spirit. You need to be quiet. Well, what does Satan try to do? He tries to intimidate. So he tried, the person pushed back and said, well, what about you, Conrad? Trying to help people, you need your own help. Nah, nope, not having it. I'm forgiven by Jesus Christ. And like, this might be intimidating other people, but God's way bigger than this. You need to be quiet. You need a hush. Well, it went on. And lots of other things in that story. Uh, I didn't tell this. I didn't tell the end of it. And I'll tell you in a moment. But what I was, number one, that was one of the greatest apologetics in my life. Like Apologetics. uh, To explain and have hope in God. Like I saw firsthand that what normally was just goosebumps when I walked into a weird situation was now sight. Who knows what I'm talking about, about the goosebumps and weird situations. The Holy Spirit's saying, yeah, there's something going on here. You need to pray, right? And it happens. <clears throat> I wanted to tell the story because this is going on all around us, and we call it other things. And we need to call it what it is, and we need to pray for discernment, which is something that we kind of lack as a church, the body of Christ. We need to pray for discernment. And we don't do these things in our power. We always do it in the power of Jesus and his finished work. That lady later on gets, gets saved. 
God works through. So all the other stuff going on, spiritual warfare, demons, all that flees in the name and the power of Jesus. Now she is like a, a Sunday school teacher in her church. Amen? Because that's what God does. And you know what? It wasn't by our might and it wasn't by our power, right? But it was by the Spirit, declares the Lord. When we say we're more than conquerors, we have to believe that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We come to you now so thankful for the cross, thankful for the truth that we are more than conquerors. We love you. We're thankful for you, Jesus. Help us to live a life worthy of the calling. We pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Thanks again so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, would you consider going and subscribing and sharing? We hope that we can help everyone discover life change through Jesus. And again, for more information on Church of the Open Door, you can go to codyork.org. And you can also follow us on social media at codyork. Thanks again for listening.